All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 11th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. A wonderful uh, Christian lady on the internet uh, some time ago uh, informed me that I did not believe in sola scriptura. I think she was of the pers Reformed persuasion in some form, and she said that I believe in scriptura nuda, Apparently, there's a distinction between those two. There must be. I, I, I agree. There must be a distinction there. And I thank her very much for that. Uh, yes, I hold to Scriptura nuda, apparently. The Scripture naked, unclothed by human tradition. Yes, I agree. That's, uh, that's my explanation of what she must mean. Because apparently, solo Scriptura does not mean what I imagined it to mean, which is Scripture alone. Hmm. Because this book repeatedly refers to, or book, collection of books, refers ex uh, repeatedly to sola scriptura. The Westminster Confession of Faith refers to sola scriptura. The 1689 London Baptist Confession refers to sola scriptura. All the magisterial reformers and the radical reformers refer to sola scriptura, at least the, the Anabaptists, the, the real Anabaptists, as opposed to the Munsterites, that which was the ap apostolic and prophetic branch. Uh, the, uh, the, the, this reincarnates itself through, throughout history. They refer, uh, Menno Simons refers to sola scriptura. Hmm. <clears throat> What's the problem? Okay. Well, I've been looking at a, a local church here, a Lutheran, um, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod denomination, and I really like the preaching there. I like the pastor there. He's my brother in Christ. Uh, I, I mean, I can see that clearly when he, when he preaches Christ. I mean, he he's almost lights up, uh, spiritually speaking. I mean, he does it with enthusiasm. I mean, you, you can know he's a true believer. And the church has a very rich uh, worship, uh, takes things seriously. The music has content to it, real lot of content, real lot of music. Um, none of this top 10 pop Christian stuff uh, that's becoming invading everywhere, it seems. Uh, the thing is a bit of a cultured shock because it is like out of the 17th century Germany or something, uh, <clears throat> including a, a crucifix, which is a, was a shock to me when I first saw that. And the pastor once in a while throws a curveball at me like, trust in your baptism, which is simply repeating what, what uh, Martin Luther said so often. Anyway, I've been looking at that, and I was going through this, and apparently this is pretty much the standard. If you're, if you're a pastor or a, uh, uh, you work for the denomination, this is, you have to swear to uphold this. The pastors are separate from the congregations. They are, not, they are employed and chosen by the congregations, but uh, it, the ordination is with the, the denomination, apparently. Anyway, so you have to swear an oath to uphold this book, not the scripture. Hmm. Is this book equal to scripture? Well, <laughs> it depends who you're listening to. This book repeatedly says solo scriptura, but what does that mean exactly? The it's like the uh, the 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 Westminster Confession of Faith, the probably the premier Reformed confession, 
Presbyterian technically, but that's just a slight matter, matter of church government. So prob the, probably the latest authoritative Calvinist confession. They definitely say sola scriptura, teach sola scriptura, but yet the confession is the standard for a church membership, for church discipline, for what you have to believe to belong to that, to a Presbyterian Orthodox, an OPC, Orthodox Presbyterian or a Presbyterian Church USA, uh, Presbyterian Ch Church of America, not USA. They're, they, somewhere back in their dim memory, they have the Westminster Confession of Faith, but that's it. And the London Baptist 1689 is a confession. It's just a ripoff of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Baptized, a baptized ripoff, uh, baptized by immersion. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and in this case, this is the Lutheran equivalent. Got a little more content, but this is this is really the the history of the Lutheran Reformation for the first. 60 years or so, 60, 70, let's say 70 years, uh, starting, uh, well, at, at starting with 1517, uh, publicly at least, and then through, uh, through uh, well, the last thing in here was a revision of the Formula Concord, and it's dated 1480, 1580, 1580. It'd be hard to be dated 1480. And... All right, that would be a, a little bit of... Uh, I guess eternally begotten us there. Nevertheless, this is, okay, the, the standards in here are determinative as far as membership, uh, especially I, I imagine the Luther's catechisms, his small catechism and his large catechism. And I was look, started looking back at that yester, uh, yesterday. Uh, we went to church yesterday, and I, I like the worship service Again, the, the content that the pastor chooses the music and the hymns. Of course, this is Christmas season, and they're, they're not like the normal Christian hymns. These are actually I, the only one I recognized was what was it? Uh, the one about uh, what is it? Come, O Israel, or something like that. Uh, the, the Messiah coming to Israel, which is in a minor tone, and it was a, a piano solo piece. Uh, for background in a certain point of the service, which they don't usually do there, but uh, it was the only thing I actually recognized from sound. But I was looking at the words as we went through there, and I'm not that familiar with the liturgy, so I have to sort of struggle paging around and with not the greatest hearing. Trying to, what song are we singing during the during the distribution of of uh, uh, the Lord's Supper, it's like there's four hymns they go through, and okay, where are we now? It, it all sort of jumbled together where I was sitting, at least. So I lost, <laughs> I lost my place. Nevertheless, it was, uh, I like it for the content, and there's a lot of things about the Lutheran Reformation. I think it's the best of the magisterial reformations. I don't want to even put the Anabaptists in there with it. Even uh, Menno Simons, because the emphasis on the Mennonites uh, to this very day and the Amish is not on the gospel itself, but rather on following Jesus. They, uh, the, uh, the Sermon of the Mount is foremost. And uh, a little bit like the Nazarenes, I, they, they don't really have a biblical view of, of imputed righteousness. And if you're trying to be righteous before God based on your own works or with your own following of Jesus or whatever it is, uh, you're pretty much toast. You're toast. Because you're not living, you're not trusting in what Jesus did, you're trusting in what you've done. And that is not going to suffice on Judgment Day. So, I thought there might be a, a roadblock coming somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there is. Because I am scriptura nuda, and don't accept anything as uh, everything is subordinated to scripture, literally in practice. So I judge everything by scripture. I judge confessions by scripture. I judge this by scripture. I judge people like Luther by scripture. 
and they don't measure up. They don't. None of us measure up. But Luther, let me give you really cut to the chase on here, and I'd like to read a, a paragraph from the from Luther's preface to this small uh, catechism, which is probably the most important document in the Lutheran churches. Uh, the the, the uh, conservative Lutheran churches, or all of them, perhaps. I don't know if they probably, maybe they still use it in the ELCA. It's hard to say. Uh, given how uh, Luther deals with some things in a small catechism, it may be uh, provide the groundwork for wokeism and uh, social justice <laughs> creeping in. It certainly is not something you want to follow if you, if you really believe in Sola Scriptura. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm appalled at Luther's, I don't even want to call it exegetical skills, but his, his willingness to, to play fast and loose with the Word of God. Of course, they, had a, they didn't have a developed, um, they didn't have a, 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 what was, a tradition of carefully handling the Word of God at that time. That is the most positive I could, thing I could say about it. Because in, uh, for example, in the, uh, the, in the small catechism, which I had to memorize, we all had to memorize that for confirmation. Uh, I think we studied it for seven, uh, three years, but mostly the, the last year we had to actually memorize it. And there were some other things they threw in there, especially the first year that were nonsense. Like they threw in the book of Jonah for a Bible study. Really? That, well, that was a church headed in the wrong direction. Anyway, a mega church, a thousand members. But I'll read the, the first chapter, or the first uh, in the, not, not the first chapter, a paragraph in the, this is the small catechism preface to it. Uh, should I read? Okay, I'm going to pick one of the, commandments in here. Of course, they don't actually have the second commandment because somehow the, the Catholic Church dropped that one. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's, I'll just read, this is with some woodcuts here. This is the fifth commandment, uh, thou sh shalt not murder. What does this mean? Answer, we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body. But help and befriend him in every bodily need, in every need and danger to his life and body. Okay. The commandment, thou shalt not murder, is that what it actually is saying? That we are obligated by that commandment to to aid our neighbor in every bodily need. Befriend him. Help him. Not hurt or harm in any way. Is that an accurate representation of what God is saying in that particular commandment? In the law, of course. I would say no. That's going way beyond what that says. You could... You could derive Luther's view from the second, the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Perhaps, but even then, you're not really obligated to go beyond, you know, this is about not murdering your neighbor. That's what it says. Do not murder. Do not unlawfully take his life. But Luther expanded it to a whole bunch of stuff. And in the process, in my opinion, negated it, essentially. He's treating God's commandment as if he can play with it as a piece of, of wax, a wax nose, as Luther complained about those who practice uh, uh, certain techniques for the Scripture. I would say he's treating the Scripture as a piece of a nose, a wax of nose, too. That's not what it says. That's not what it means. He's going beyond. He's adding to what the Scripture says while he's taking away the import because he does not actually say in here at all, kill or murder. 
he says, hurt or harm. Help and befriend in every, uh, in every need. Doesn't actually mention murder at all. I object. Another example. <clears throat> Thou shalt not bear false witness. In this one, he actually completely negates the commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? Again, you have to, you have to memorize, or we did, uh, both the commandment and Luther's understanding. Answer. We should fear and love God so that we may not deceitfully uh, belie, betray, slander, or defame our neighbor. But defend him. Think well of him. And think and speak well of him and put the best construction on everything. Bear false witness is in regard to testimony in court. <clears throat> That's what bearing false witness means. L providing lying false testimony in court. It doesn't mean uh, what Luther says it means. There's other commandments that you can apply to that. But this is going beyond the actual meaning of this commandment. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. In the Old Testament law, the penalty for that, bearing false witness, was to receive the punishment that the, uh, the accused would receive. So if you were uh, bearing false witness uh, in a death penalty situation and... You were, it was discovered that you were deliberately bearing false witness, not just defective witness, but false witness, deliberately false witness. You were lying in order to, to uh, either get the person off or to, to condemn the person. You were subject to the death penalty for that. <clears throat> so Luther does not deal with the real situation, but instead expands it and doesn't even mention the real meaning at all. <sighs> then the last commandment, which Luther, like the Catholic Church, split into two. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, which is actually the first clause in the real commandment, which is the 10th commandment, because the commandment against idolatry is missing. We should fear and love God so that we do not craftily seek to get our neighbor's inheritance or his house. To obtain it by a show of, uh, 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 by a show of justice, in other words, by false legal means or right, claiming uh, that it actually is yours when it's not, or by any other means but help and be of service to him in keeping the possession of his house. Then the rest of that commandment is... Uh, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his cattle, or anything that is his. What does this mean? Answer, we are to fear and love God so that we may not turn uh, force or entice away from our neighbor, uh, away from our neighbor's wife, entice away our neighbor's wife, servants, cattle, or urge them to stray and carefully to, uh, urge them to stay and carefully do their duty. Is that what that commandment, or in his case, commandments are about? Is that what coveting means? No, it does not. The whole force of the Tenth Commandment is not to desire those things that God has not given you, but rather covet what God has given to someone else. This is a whole social justice movement in a nutshell. Coveting other people's possessions. It's not fair. Why? I deserve exactly the same thing everybody else gets. <laughs> you mean like the justice of God? <sighs> That's the kind of social justice you want? to be judged on account of your deeds. 
Everybody will receive God's mercy or, or, or I should say God's grace or God's justice. I suggest you choose the former. So the commandment is all about not being satisfied with what God has given, your daily bread. Israel in the wilderness, what happened? They grumbled against God repeatedly because they, they got tired of God's gift of manna that tasted like wafers made with honey and water. So the bread and water. They got tired of divine bread and divinely supplied water, water coming from a supernatural rock, which is Christ. And so God judged them for that. They, they lusted after the, the food of Egypt, the quail, the garlics, the leeks, the fish. They wanted that more than they wanted God. They coveted the food of Egypt. They were not satisfied with God's provision. That is what coveting is. It's not being content with what God gives you, but rather being discontent with God and his provision. That's, a, that's the essence of, co of coveting. And it's a strong desire. It's not looking at your neighbor's uh, possessions. It says house. Oh, he, that's such a nice little house. He keeps it nice and clean and well manicured. And, or he, he, my neighbor's got such a wonderful wife. She's beautiful, and she takes care of him. She, she's a lovely woman, uh, uh, nice spiritual lady. That's not coveting. It's saying, I'm not satisfied with my wife. I want his. And if you go too far on that, that is adultery, too. But that is the Luther misses the entire center core of what it means to covet your neighbor's possessions. Not being satisfied with what God gives you. Discontent with God and his provision. That's what that commandment's about. Luther misses it completely. So I am not impressed with Luther's skill when it comes to handling the scriptures at all. But let me read one last thing. And, and this is actually not nearly as bad in some ways as what he puts in the preface to, uh, pre uh, preface to his large commandment, which he makes, basically makes his, his, his large commandment his large catechism, he basically makes it equal or superior to Scripture. And he seems to believe that, that, that the, whole, the total sum of Christian faith is contained in his catechism, which contains, both of them contain the, the, central, the five elements that Luther thinks is the Christian faith. It is uh, the Lord's Prayer. It is the Apostles' Creed. It is the Ten Commandments. It is the doctrine of baptism, the, the, uh, the uh, sacrament of baptism, and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. To Luther, that is the sum total of Christianity. What he says, I'll just read this one paragraph out of the uh, preface to the small catechism. And he goes on and on about this stuff. You could pick a lot of other things, too, that just I don't want this video to be too long. So he says here, uh, in case you happen to have this book, this is on page uh, 314. And if you can see where my finger is pointing right there, that, that paragraph. Second paragraph on the page. But to those who are unwilling to learn the catechism, uh, excuse me, but those who are unwilling to learn the catechism should be told that they deny Christ and are not Christians because they're unwilling to learn Luther's book. They deny Christ and are not Christians. They should not be admitted to the sacrament. That would be the sacrament of the altar. Accepted as sponsors at baptism or practice any part of Christian freedom. What does that mean? Lock them up? They should simply be turned back to the Pope and his officials. Indeed, to the devil himself. No, they shouldn't be locked up. They should be executed. Destroyed. Anathematized. Turned over to the devil himself. 
1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. I'm going to have to look that up. I didn't actually read this carefully. <laughs> 1 Corinthians. It was just like, really? So this is what he suggests here. Deliver such a one. So if a person is unwilling to study and learn Luther's small catechism, deliver such a one to Satan. For the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So what is the context there? What is this person actually guilty of? This is the man who is sleeping with his mother-in-law, apparently. His father's wife. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality that is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. That is the context. And he says in verse 4, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together with, uh, along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Luther, in his arrogance, equates those that do not want to learn his small catechism with this man that the Apostle Paul is determined to turn over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The man who was sleeping with his own mother-in-law. Immorality such was not even named among the Gentiles. Is there something wrong here? I think so. Furthermore, the parents and employers should refuse them food and drink and notify them that the, pre, pre, uh, the prince will drive such rude people from the country. This is Martin Luther. He sounds more like the Pope, maybe worse. This is unacceptable, utterly unacceptable. I will not accept this kind of stuff. Absolutely will not accept it. I will not uh, subordinate the Word of God, whether Christ himself or the Scriptures, to any man-made document, especially one done so badly as Luther's small catechism. And I will not waste two years studying such a thing. Luther had his days when he was to be admired, but then he had his days like that, his attitude. And again, the prefix, uh, prefix, uh, preface to the large, command, uh, large catechism, he, he treats his own work as if it is at least equal to the Scriptures. So much for, if that's what sola scriptura means, I hold to sola, or scriptura nuda, because sola scriptura apparently does not mean scripture alone. Why, O oh Lord? And when churches or denominations set any standard for church membership other than what the Bible sets, faith in Christ, Baptism. You must, according to the instructions of the Scripture, receive those who are weak in faith, and not for the purpose of debating with them. Doubtful disputation, as the King James says. Not for debating with them about doubtful things. like what foods you're permitted to eat. Today it would be 
whether a Christian can be a vegetarian. Some ridiculous thing like that, which Paul deals with quite well. You cannot set this up as a standard for church membership or require pastors, elders, to swear allegiance to a man, a set of man-made documents. This is not Scripture. It doesn't represent Scripture very well at all at times. What do you do with things like Luther? Luther at his worst. The, the arrogant Luther. The Well, he talks about others. That, I'm a doctor of the law. Or, you know, he, I'm, I'm a doctor. So therefore, listen to me. Really? I see lots of people on, uh, especially on YouTube, young, uh, young doctors with PhDs or THDs or DDs or whatever alphabet soup they have after their name. Do they know Christ? Is Christ in them? That is the standard biblically of what makes a person a Christian. Is Christ in you? Is his spirit in you? That's where Paul places the identity of a Christian. They've been born again, and the Spirit of God dwells in them. And if a person, because of a persistently wicked lifestyle, lawless lifestyle, they're an embezzler or a thief or an adulterer or practicing an immoral lifestyle, it's an ongoing thing. Put them out of the church because they're obviously not regenerate. They have not been born again. For their sake and for the sake of the church and for the sake of the world, that they may know that Christians cannot do those things because God will not permit it. That's the standard. That's the only reason for excluding people other than rank unbelief except those who are weak in faith. So if we're not going to go by God's standards, by the, test, the standards of the New Testament, by what's taught in the epistles, by the apostles themselves, but we choose to go by man's standards, standards and by man-made documents and follow Martin Luther rather than the Apostle Paul, what are you? What are you doing? how Satan has managed to drag everything down. That we're willing to disobey Christ in order to hold to our own standards. May God have mercy on us and cleanse the church of this kind of nonsense. Save us, O Lord, from our stupidity and our arrogance for, from exalting ourselves above you. Because that's what we're doing, whether we understand it or not. <laughs>